21 million American families have video cassette recorders. The Video Software Dealers Association says 40% of them took home an X-rated cassette last year. And many took home more than that. The producers of pornography claim that as many X cassettes were rented last year as there were votes cast for Ronald Reagan. This year they'll produce 1,700 new movies. That's 10 times the number Hollywood will put out. We have a quiet in the house, please. Shut up! Okay. That's me. Come on in. On an otherwise sedate street outside San Francisco, you're on the set of a porn movie in the making. Most Hollywood movies take millions of dollars and months to complete. This one will be made in a day on a budget lower than the cut of the costume. Okay, action. $25,000 total. Well, is that a bit more to your liking? Last year, Americans spent $115 million on movies like this. Okay, next one's scene five. It's shot directly on videotape, and it'll go from this set to your shopping mall's video store in four weeks at a profit of 300%. The FBI says the porn business is the third largest source of income for organized crime. At this summer's Chicago Consumer Convention, amidst the explosion of home electronics, the business of video porn was booming. Once underground, it's now over the counter. More than 50 companies who sell sex on cassette openly display their latest lusty titles and their steamy stars of the little screen. I have to be alone with my stars. These are my stars. These are my life. I got to shake the hand of a real John Hall. I sell a lot of your product. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I've been waiting all morning for you. When I saw the sign that said you won't be until noon, I was so depressed. You look better in person than in your movies. Take a picture? Sure. She is Seika, known as the Platinum Princess of Porn. Hey, 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 none of that. I need one more, Jim. I need two. And he is Harry Reams. His career fizzled after the infamous film Deep Throat, but he's back because of X cassettes and the ever-expanding number of people who think that porn's place is in the home. I think everybody's fascinated with everyone else's sexuality. Now that the new technology allows us to view others, we, out of curiosity, are becoming voyeurs. Paradise Visuals presents Lost in Space. It's people of all types, businessmen, lawyers, doctors, everything renting them, a lot of women renting them. Yeah. We have all our friends in, and we just sort of have a nice little popcorn movie time. That's our newest one that just came out, and it is selling like hotcakes. We don't have to hide to watch them anymore. It's acceptable. I'd like to know, is it normal for a husband and wife to look at and enjoy pornographic movies? <laughs> you know, for Arthur, I have to say something, that if both enjoy sexually explicit movies, Great. I think it sets something pathetic about the country. I think we're an entire nation confused about sex, and people are going to take these tapes home, look at them, think, oh, this is going to help me with my sex life, and then they're going to end up more... Susan Brown Miller is the founder of Women Against Pornography, a national organization with thousands of members. It's an extension of those tacky sex manuals of the 1950s. It really is. And it's the same old garbage, too. Behind it all, there is the message that the real turn-on of sex is uh, guilt and shame and dirt. That's, you know, that's sad for America. And Caballero keeps on coming with more of the hottest hits for 1985. Sure, winners for retailers. One company dominates the ex-cassette business. It's called Caballero, and Al Bloom runs it. He agreed to talk with us on the condition that we not ask him about any role organized crime might play in his industry. Hardware is, uh, is being sold at such a phenomenal rate that every person that buys a VCR, uh, the first trip they make is to the video store to get an X-rated movie. In 1978, we started with eight people. We now have a complex in Canoga Park of almost 400 people. This is my commodity. This is what I sell. This is what I do. Is marketing these things any different than marketing Mickey Mouse? No, it's, everything is exactly the same as marketing any movie feature on video cassette today. But these aren't just any other features. The themes are often shockingly extreme. A Cavalero subsidiary distributes this one called Taboo 2, 
about incest. Can I help you, Mom? Sure. You sure are pretty. The dealers say, look, it's being rented by people, it's selling big, they're making a lot of money off these things. Why do you think something like incest movies, Taboo 2, is a bestseller? Yeah, well, we know what's wrong with a theme like incest. There's an ethical problem here. I mean, I really do believe that when people see something, when it comes to them with great production values especially, they begin to think that this is normal, acceptable behavior. Do you have any moral line about what you will and won't handle as a company? Did you say moral? Moral line? Yeah. Um, as I stated before, we, uh, we are looking to make an appeal to middle America. That's where the appeal is with our company. But what Bloom sells is dividing America down the middle. At this mall in Phoenix, the video store owner is facing felony charges and a million dollar fine for renting hardcore cassettes. It's part of a wave of crackdowns which could determine if movies like these will be available at your corner store. We'd look for something uh, involving violence, children, animals. Uh, Tom Collins is what the porn people call a lust buster. He's the county attorney here. We asked him to walk us through the stories prosecuting to explain where he draws the line between bad taste and legally obscene. Probably the scenes involving the rape of women, insertion of nightsticks, insertion of vegetables in a film where the whole theme of it is mother, son, father, daughter, brother, sister, intercourse. You mean it's all right for me to let my child watch in the family room a video cassette of a man with a chainsaw chopping up 19 bodies and blood shooting everywhere and he said it's not all right for me to watch sex in the bedroom. Across Phoenix, a coalition of more than 100 stores has been oh, formed yeah. to fight the indictment. Sure. Linda Lauer runs it. I don't believe morally there is anything wrong with what we are renting or selling. I can understand that people don't want to see them, and that's fine. I, I, that is their choice, and I don't want to see all of them. But would you really like to see these yeah. shelves just wiped clean of this stuff? Uh, looking at this, yes. Community, society, we'd be better off if we weren't exploiting women and doing this kind of stuff. We have tried to put romance back into the story so that there's a reason for the sex act, and after the sex act, uh, there is a loving relationship. There is something beyond just wham, bam, thank you, Sam. I've seen a substantial number of these movies, and I definitely do not agree with that. I think in a small percentage of the films, there are images of love and uh, equal roles between men and women, but in the majority, it remains very much the same. Neil Malamuth is a UCLA psychologist who study the dangers of pornographic movies. The themes are women are there to serve men. Dominance of men over women is natural and justified, and there clearly is a danger of continuously trying to break into more and more taboo areas, and what was unacceptable a few years ago becoming very acceptable now, and we can see that. I got some outrageous prices for you. Are you gonna pass on Marilyn Chambers' Private Fantasies number four? I don't believe you said that. I took home a movie that's coming out with Private Fantasies 4 uh -huh. from Caballero called Blue Ice. It's the best X-rated yeah, movie I've ever seen. Off. There is Nazism in this, although it's not negative Nazism. It's, uh, they're the bad guys for sure. And there was Helga, half Fraulein, half Fuhrer. Apparently, Nazi group sex fits Caballero's vision of what middle America wants to watch. They had gathered there to perform an experiment using a potent sex drug they had developed. The guinea pig was a peasant girl, stolen from a local convent. No one can convince me that scenes of bondage and mutilation and, 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 and Nazis and, and, and incest has anything to do with good sex, and no one can convince me that this can't have a bad effect on, on people's heads. Since no one else will salute the porn makers, they gather once a year to reward themselves. Hi there. We did a movie together. She and I that's nominated tonight. Every woman has a fantasy. What's in the future on that? What do you have? Um, I've got eight more films to do with Vivid Video. And I'm retiring in December. Welcome to orgy number nine. I'm in love. Ladies and gentlemen, the ninth annual Erotic Film Awards X marks the spot. And as the self-congratulation goes on, 
so does the rush to make more triple X tapes. Okay, so I have one line in this before I come back to do my lines with what's his That's face. right. Uh, if you can aim things out toward this camera here, I mean, I'll be picking them with both. How do you direct a best erotic scene? Wipe this out! You get four very pretty people and introduce them and say, uh... Action. Oh. I thank you from the bottom of my heart and, uh, see you next year. Thank you very much. It's been said that every generation gets the pornography it deserves. If that's true, what do you think this says about our generation? It's an example of uh, the entertainment business and uh, high technology and performance values uh, taking precedence over ethical values, isn't it? Put a little muscle into that trainee. But this is Haynes boys' underwear, Inspector 12. I thought I should be gentle. Gentle? Did you ever see a boy wrestle? Did you ever see a boy slide into second base? Why, boys are worse than men when it comes to... Every Hanes t-shirt and brief has to pass 11 quality tests and Inspector 12. They don't say Hanes until I say they say Hanes. Now on sale, Hanes men's and boys underwear. Most Air Express companies charge extra for delivery to out-of-the-way places. We don't. In fact, Federal Express can get your package to just about anybody overnight. So, if you have something that absolutely, positively has to be somewhere, give us a call. <laughs> Federal Express. Why fool around with anyone else? Violence against women is becoming a recurring theme in the movies. Maybe selling tickets, but it's also provoking criticism from women's groups and the public in general. This morning in the first of two reports, Pat Collins is here to take a look at that disturbing trend. This report, we want to warn you, is not for children, and it may not be for some adults either. Good morning, Pat. Good morning again, Jane. After my negative review of Body Double and Crimes of Passion a few weeks ago, we had an overwhelmingly supportive response from the audience, and that response prompted, in part, this series. We are not dealing with X-rated pornographic movies, but R-rated movies, like Halloween, Friday the 13th, Dress to Kill, and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They are popular on cable and college campuses, available on video cassette, and in some cases shown with very little editing on network television. A few are cult films, but others are the work of the so-called respected directors and are considered mainstream entertainment, seen by millions of teenagers who have made them hugely successful at the box office. In the industry, they are called slasher, or slice and dice movies, and in all of them, the principal victims are women who are brutalized, raped, or murdered. Given our broadcast standards, we cannot show you the gory and graphic scenes from these R-rated movies. The scenes we will show you are mild compared to the rest of the movie. And again, our report is not suitable viewing for children. The woman as victim. It's been a traditional element in movies for decades. But in the last decade, a profound change has taken place. Explicit violence has replaced suspense. The master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock, believed blondes made the best victims. But Hitchcock also believed in leaving something to the imagination. Nothing is left to the imagination in two recently released movies. If you're real nice to me, I'll tell you all about the time he tied my arms to the bed with black twine. Did he really do that? Crimes of Passion is a de facto pornographic movie about a dress designer who moonlights as a prostitute. Tony Perkins is a self-styled minister who plans to kill her to save her. In Body Double, directed by Brian De Palma, two women are in jeopardy. A porno movie star named Holly Body and a Beverly Hills millionaires who is killed with an electric drill. The movie's critics say the drill is a phallic symbol. Now, you will also notice that when he murders her with the drill, his legs are apart. That drill comes right between his legs. It is so symbolic. Body Double, Crimes of Passion, and the R-rated slasher movies have one thing in common. They combine sex and violence in graphic detail. 
the woman is always a victim. She's always the one who gets murdered, uh, usually in some uh, position of, sex, of, of being sexual. And this combination of sex and violence just comes through over and over again. Uh, a common theme and many common scenes in those types of films today compared to many years ago is very graphic forms of violence, but again, violence which has sort of an erotic sexual overtone to it. Again, the classic type of bathtub shower scene. Sort of like Psycho going astray, I guess. I, I guess what we've done today compared to maybe 15, 20 years ago is we've opened up the shower curtain, so now we have a very erotic, beautiful scene. But we also see the knife going in and out and in and out, so we have much more graphic violence uh, juxtaposed or associated with that very sensual erotic scene than we ever had before. The fact that I have a murder in my movie and then there's, some, there's a pornographic film star, I don't think you can directly tie the sex to the violence, and I think it's a false, false connection. I think there's a very real connection in women being raped in movies, or raped and killed. And I've never had a rape in a movie of mine. Violence against women is often eroticized, and it's clear that some men are, are sexually aroused by it. Secondly, there's a suggestion that somehow the victim, the woman, derived pleasure or wanted to be aggressed against, and this almost never happens with violence against men. And the research suggests that there is something particularly powerful about the fusion of sex and violence that may have more negative effects than if violence alone is depicted. The effects of these R-rated movies on the audience have been studied by Dr. Neil Malamuth of UCLA and Dr. Edward Donestein of the University of Wisconsin. One research method includes exposing college-age men to a series of sexually violent movies over a period of several days. You find that initially people are very bothered by the material. With repeated exposure, however, you begin to find less and less feelings of anxiety, depression, annoyance. And in fact, in some of the subjects we deal with, they begin to enjoy the material. They find it somewhat pleasurable. They become what we call desensitized. They're less bothered with repeated exposure. It may not be the case that the person who's exposed to these kinds of films is going to go and commit an act of violence himself. But as his attitudes change, the way his attitudes may affect his responses to women, his attitudes towards other men, the way he behaves towards them when he hears that they may have committed an act of violence, all these can change. And in that way, they can affect a social climate that makes acts of violence more acceptable, and therefore acts of violence against women may be more likely to occur. They tend to be a little more accepting of myths about rape and a little more accepting of certain attitudes about violence. Is the defense prepared with its opening statement? In his study, Dr. Donestein followed the movies with a mock rape trial. The young men who had seen these sexually violent films served as members of the jury. After the desensitization, I and most of the people I talked to said that they said she wasn't raped. They, the desensitization to violence, especially against women, that we saw affected us in the rape trial. We said she wasn't raped. She asked for it. Um, she initiated it. I think I would go the other way today. I would say, yes, she was raped. So when we see such brutal forms of rape on the screen, what happens when we now confront a real rape victim who hasn't been mutilated? Uh, what we tend to find in the research is some subjects say, well, that real rape really isn't rape. This is rape, what I've seen on the screen. In 1982, one movie in 20 contained violence against women. Just one year later, in 1983, that figure rose to one movie in eight. Let's look at another statistic. In 1983, there were 79,000 reported rape cases in America. One in seven female children is sexually abused by the time she reaches 18, and that's the conservative estimate. Even the U.S. Attorney General's Task Force on Family Violence came out with a report just two months ago saying that the evidence is overwhelming, that there's a cause-effect connection between the uh, consumption of violent entertainment and the high levels of violence in the American family. Dr. Thomas Radecki sees the impact of these movies firsthand as a psychiatrist in private practice in Champaign, Illinois. 
Well, it's just real common for me to have patients tell me that their husbands from watching violent pornography or very violent R-rated movies, that they want the women to go along with them to reenact the very types of things that the husbands watched in the movies, being tied down to the bed, have their toes uh, clothes torn off, being raped. And uh, some of the women patients uh, actually went along with them somewhat, trying to please their husbands. They found that this type of uh, fascination with sadism and brutal sex just increased and increased, and of course led to their divorces and, and the patients, of course, brutally traumatized by the time they get to me. Uh, and trying to help them overcome that uh, often takes years. And why are these movies made? Because they make money. And who sees them may surprise you. Not only older teenagers and young adults, but children under 14 and 15. Tomorrow we'll look at the potentially devastating impact of these R-rated films. And we'll also have some recommendations on how parents and communities can deal with these movies. I guess the best way to deal with them in some ways is just to uh, cast your vote at the box office. I don't go. I, d I can't stand them. But you are not the audience they're being made I for. I know it. That's, so that's why you don't go. Who's Do women going? women go to these movies? Some of the women go as dates. Um, you know, people still date. Bill, remember the days when you dated? They date, and if the young fellow, college or high school, says we're going to see um, Dress to Kill or Body Double or Crimes of Passion, they usually go. Go along with the and, But the, 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 the trick is most people don't know what's in the movies. And the parents, I find, particularly do not know the content of these movies because the movie rating system, and we'll get into this tomorrow, is very cloudy in this area. I'm looking Great forward report. to part two, yeah. Mm. Thank you.